Hello and welcome to this course. Uh, this is Introduction to Photonics. I will start the lecture today by just giving you a little bit of background as to how this course was conceptualized in the first place. Uh, you uh, go through a certain level of optics in as part of your high school education. Uh, where you learn about the basic laws of reflection, refraction and based on that uh, you, you cover a few topics. And then when you come to college, uh, you are typically uh, experiencing uh, more advanced courses such as optical communications, uh, photonic integrated circuits, optical sensors um, and biophotonics and so on. And uh, what we thought is we actually need a bridge between the two because uh, certain level of uh, fundamentals that are taught in the uh, high school level is not enough to clearly appreciate the kind of uh, uh, concepts that you are encountering at the advanced level courses. So uh, we decided to float this course as sort of a bridge between the two. and. Um, and of course, this course has been uh, now offered for several years uh, to several sets of students where we have uh, clearly had an opportunity to uh, look at the finer aspects of the course and uh, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, patch them up. Now, before we move on, let me ask you this question. Why are you in this course? Why, you know, photonics? Uh, what are the typical things that you use light for? At this point, if some of the students present here can uh, participate, I'd appreciate it. What do we use light for? Sure, uh, that's a very, very good example. Uh, optical communications is clearly uh, one reason why, um, in certain ways, we can say it's one reason why we have all this wireless communication at this level. Uh, because. Uh, what you do when you have your mobile phone, you take up your mobile phone and uh, do a phone call is you are trying to uh, use electromagnetic waves in the RF region to communicate to an antenna, nearby antenna, right? And uh, chances are from that antenna on to the exchange or from that exchange to other exchanges at different parts of the country or different parts of the world, it, the chances are that it's going to be carried through optical communication. So, in certain ways, optical communications has uh, revolutionized this uh, whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, field of communication. So, that's a very good example as to why, uh, why do we need to study about light. What else? So, simple example is, you know, how are you able to see me? Uh, the whole process of human vision is is based on light, right? So you have a light source here. You have all these uh, uh, lights, LED lamps, and fluorescent lamps uh, that are illuminating. Light is falling on me, getting scattered, and and you know you are actually able to see this image in your eye. So your eye is your detector in this case, right? So the whole process of human vision is based on the fact that we are able to use light and we are able to detect light. Uh, and, and of course, an extension of that you can say is all the imaging that is happening, including uh, you know what you do with your mobile phones is based on that sort of a principle, uh, this, this uh, vision principle which uses light. So what else? Biomedical imaging, uh, clearly you know a lot of things uh, uh, you are able to see uh, you know, parts of uh, the, the human body, like internal parts of the human body through optical probes, through endoscopy, you are able to do imaging of what is happening inside our body through the uh, endoscopes. And of course, even in terms of uh, what is happening in our eye, what is happening in, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the surface of our body, we are able to image using uh, biomedical imaging. So, uh, we use we use light for that. Um, what else? Let's let's get a little more modern. Let's let's get more up to date. Wh where else do we use light these days? You heard of augmented reality. So what is augmented reality? It's basically uh, you have a display that comes in uh, that mixes 
two different scenarios and uh, it's able to give you extra information than what you normally have uh, with your uh, regular vision, right? So, that whole thing about augmented reality which is actually one of the uh, uh, disruptive technologies that's going around. There are a lot of uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies, technology companies, uh, the, uh, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Googles, they're all out there, um, you know, trying to come up with augmented reality solutions. And uh, uh, certainly there is uh, a lot of development happening in, in that domain. And, and then, of course, you can extend that to uh, things like autonomous driving. So you have a driverless car and, uh, and, and you know, a, a simpler version of that could be a robo, right? So robotic, robotics, the whole thing about robotics, it's able to see the, uh, you know, things around it and, and able to take actions. So all of those uh, require light-based technologies. Uh, so, so light certainly plays a fairly big role uh, in our everyday lives and it continues to uh, change the way uh, we see things around us and uh, we uh, get things done around us. So uh, it's so much so that by 2050, there is some prediction that most of the Fortune 500 companies uh, around the world uh, will be having some, something or the other to do with photonics, okay. So that's why we are here. We are here to understand uh, the properties of light, how to generate light, how to detect light and how to manipulate light, how to uh, make light work for us, right. So that's what this course is about. So let me go down here and uh, uh, start making a few notes. So clearly uh, we are at this course which is introduction to photonics, right? And, uh, and we just started discussing uh, why photonics and uh, we started uh, discussing some examples of uh, what's the use of uh, light and uh, we said the whole process of human vision is uh, based on light, right? And then you extend that to uh, imaging concepts uh, using cameras, using endoscopes, you are able to uh, uh, see things around us. And then uh, uh, somebody gave this example of uh, uh, optical communications where uh, we uh, use light to carry information uh, which has completely revolutionized uh, this uh, whole field of uh, communications. And uh, then we are, uh, we can list out uh, things like uh, material processing. So you take once again your mobile phone as an example, uh, uh, you have different parts of the mobile phone, uh, you know, manufactured with such high precision and some of these in, may involve actually laser based uh, marking, laser based cutting and so on. So there's a lot of material processing applications for which light is used. And uh, uh, going forward, things like Augmented reality, uh, there is something called uh, gesture recognition. So gesture recognition is the uh, next big thing as far as uh, man-machine interface is concerned. We are always trying to work on concepts which can uh, break down this interface between the man and machine and, uh, and, and this is the next level wherein you just based on some gestures, you are able to uh, communicate with the machine and you are able to, uh, uh, you know, the you are able to make the computer understand that you are giving certain commands, uh, uh, certain instructions for the computer to uh, do things for us. Um, so, so we can keep mo going on in that and some of the more recent, uh, you know, developments or uh, towards going to the next generation of computers based on quantum computing 
and so on. So all of these are essentially, uh, you know, based on things where uh, we we manipulate light. Okay, so in from that perspective, you can go back and say when what we mean by photonics is photonics is the signs of light. Through uh, understanding the signs of light, we can uh, uh, we we can do certain things like uh, what are the properties of uh, uh, light, right? We can we can try to understand what are the properties of light. We can uh, uh, try to understand the generation and detection of light. And then probably more importantly, you can look at the manipulation of light. So what do we mean by manipulation of light? You know, light has certain uh, properties. So if you want to describe light, what are the terms that you use to describe light? Very good. So let's list this out. Wavelength is, is one characteristic or in other words, in, in colloquial terms, the color of light, right? So I'm using different colors here obviously to, um, you know, denote different things and uh, uh, that essentially means that the, these different colors represent different wavelengths of light. What else? Intensity. So you have amplitude of light and of course uh, through that you can uh, look at the intensity of light. What else? Phase certainly is another property and another property which is probably not huh? polarization, very good. So we have an opportunity to change certain properties of the light and through that realize certain functionalities, right? So that's what we're going to be, uh, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at as far as this course is concerned. So at this point, maybe I, I should step back and uh, show you the outline of the course, what, what exactly we're going to be seeing as far as this course is concerned. So you have one module, uh, the, the first module, which corresponds to uh, understanding the properties of light. And uh, when we talk about understanding the properties of light, uh, first thing that we look at is um, this important, very important principle called wave particle duality. You know, you in colloquial terms, you would see that certain people refer to the science of light as optics. And certain other section of people look at it as, as photonics. Are they different? Not really. Possibly when somebody is talking about optics, what they are uh, looking at is things that are uh, properties that are uh, based on the wave nature of light. And when somebody is talking about photonics, they are talking about physical processes which involve the particle nature of light. Okay, so we are going to go into some of those details and try to appreciate where uh, we can use the wave nature of light and where we, we need to use the particle nature of light and all that. So we'll look at some of those to start with and then we will go into this important discussion which is probably a fulcrum uh, uh, as far as this course is concerned because um, when we look at the properties of light, you start understanding that uh, light is in, in, in general random in nature, right? In terms of, uh, uh, you know, the emission of photons, in terms of detection of photons, you uh, start understanding that there is a certain statistics associated with, uh, with, with those processes. And uh, in fact, it's only to uh, explain those statistics which we try to do uh, in terms of uh, coherence uh, property of light 
you start appreciating that maybe it doesn't help just to treat light as waves, maybe you need to look at the particle nature of light as well. Okay. So, this really, uh, this topic is really the motivation to look closely at the uh, particle nature of light and so, uh, you know, beyond that we are looking at the properties of a photon, um, uh, the properties, uh, the statistics of the photon and so on. And then beyond that, we are at a position to understand interaction of these photons with atomic systems, with matter. Okay. So, we will start looking into how this absorption and em emission processes happen and through that process, you come up with this realization that there is something called stimulated light emission. Okay. And if you look at uh, you know, stimulated light emission, you, you start understanding that maybe things like light amplification is possible, right. And um, then once we have realized that, we are at a point where we can start making light sources. So, we will jump into uh, understanding the fundamentals of lasers, which is by itself is a complete course. Uh, but what we are trying to do is just look at some of the basic concepts as far as lasers are concerned. And then the most commonly used light sources are the semiconductor uh, light emitting diodes and uh, uh, some of these light panels are based on semiconductor light emitting diodes. And uh, uh, semiconductor lasers like a laser pointer, if I am using a laser pointer, I am using a semiconductor uh, laser typically. Okay. Um, and then we go on to understand uh, light detection and that once again, once we have understood the basics of semiconductor uh, uh, PN junctions, we can also uh, figure out how light detection can be possible using your semiconductor light detectors, the photodiodes, um, what goes into uh, your mobile camera for example, um, you know all those principles. And uh, beyond that, we will go on to looking at the manipulation of light. So, that is our last module, right. So, we will look at how uh, light can interact with RF waves that are electromagnetic waves, uh, uh, radio frequency electromagnetic waves and acoustic waves. Can you believe that? You can manipulate light using acoustic waves. You know, so how, how are we able to do that? I, I, those are some of the principles we are going to look at in week 10. And, uh, and, and beyond that, we can also look at how to manipulate photons through uh, nonlinear properties of material, nonlinear response of material. For the most part in the course, we are looking at interaction of light with material as, as if it is a linear response that we are getting from the material, but towards the last portion, we will look at what if the material responds non-linearly to the uh, light that is incident on it. Uh, so, what can we do uh, with, with, with that sort of a property, right. So, this is essentially, I have charted it out as for 11 weeks, it may actually uh, spill over to 12 weeks. Um, but one important aspect of this particular course, uh, the way it is taught for you students here is that it is going to be a theory come practical course. So, each week we will actually be doing a laboratory session which is enhancing your understanding on that particular concept that, that was taught that week. It is to the point that your laboratory sessions are essentially driving what we are discussing in the theoretical uh, aspects of this course. Okay. And for those of you that are uh, doing this course online, what we will be able to do on a weekly basis is uh, provide a uh, demonstration of those concepts, so that you can follow what is what's going on. Uh, essentially, what the students do, the students here do in the laboratory, uh, you will be able to do that, uh, you will be able to watch that at least as, as an in-class uh, demonstration. Okay, so uh, so and and so 
clearly the uh, the lab sessions that are defined over here are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, are, are enhancing uh, those those uh, practical aspects that we are going to study as far as this course is concerned as far as the textbook for this course is concerned i'm going to be closely following this uh, excellent textbook um, which is written by Sale and Taish, uh, Fundamentals of Photonics. It's just that, you know, Sale and Taish puts this material in such a way that you can start from appreciating some of the wave properties of light and, and then go on to appreciating the photon, um, uh, you know, uh, properties of light. Um, so, so it's it's nicely structured, uh, uh, which is in tune with what I want to teach as far as this course is concerned. So, um, so we're going to adopt that as the textbook, and of course there are certain other reference books that are provided, uh, which can uh, be helpful in understanding these concepts at a deeper level. Okay, so we uh, looked at why photonics. Uh, I mean, why we are why we are offering this course, and then. Uh, uh, closer to why uh, it makes sense to uh, follow uh, this course. Um, so, and, and we also said uh, essentially uh, what we are doing in this course is uh, dealing with uh, photonics um, where we are uh, looking at the properties of uh, photons, light in general. Then um, this uh, generation and uh, uh, detection of photons and uh, manipulation of photons. Okay, so those are the three uh, primary modules that we're going to be uh, studying as far as this course concerned. And uh, let's first start uh, with uh, understanding the uh, properties of light. And uh, to do that, we will have to uh, step back and take an historical perspective of the science of light, how it came about. And uh, it all starts with a, a, a simple uh, concept called ray optics. And ray optics is primarily based on uh, this observation by uh, a scientist uh, by name Fermat in the uh, early 1600s, right? Fermat essentially hypothesized at the time that light travels in path of least time, okay? So what does that mean? Light travels in the path of le least time uh, in a homogeneous medium. It actually corresponds to saying that light travels in straight lines. If I use a, a is, is this light source over here, I can essentially model this light source as rays of light that are, you know, coming and hitting me and from me bouncing off to you, okay. So once you are able to say that light travels in straight paths, you can use rays to represent the propagation of light and that is the simplest way of uh, explaining, you know, how uh, light travels through different uh, media, okay. So ray optics is uh, a fairly powerful concept as far as understanding uh, properties of light is concerned and that is going to be a, the starting point of most of the discussions that we uh, do in this, in the early part of the course. Okay, um, and then there is this other scientist, um, so Fermat said light uh, travels in straight lines, which we are calling as rays, and then this other person by name Huygens 
in the mid 1600s, he came up with the hypothesis that uh, light travels as waves, just like uh, you know sound waves. Uh, uh, Huygens hypothesized that light light also has uh, demonstrates wave-like property. Okay, so that happens to be superseding what we are seeing in, in ray optics. So, you get into what is called wave optics and what is the important aspect of waves? What are we introducing when we talk about waves? So, wavelength. So, we start uh, introducing things like uh, wavelength, and uh, this whole concept of phase that that light carries, you know, so that is actually uh, it's it's easily explained when you have a wave. So when you are looking at them as rays, the rays don't represent any particular color, nor does it represent any accumulation of phase as it propagates. Okay, it just tells about the direction of light. But uh, now when we discuss this in terms of waves, uh, you start uh, saying, okay, there are, there are these other characteristics that come into the picture. And uh, then came this, um, you know, uh, this, this declaration from um, um, uh, Maxwell around the mid uh, 1850s mid 1800s, where uh, he declared that uh, light travels as EM waves, electromagnetic waves, okay. And that actually brought about another study. Um, based on modeling light waves as electromagnetic waves. And what could possibly come out of something like this? What do you, what, what do you think you can explain, uh, you know, when you are talking about light as electromagnetic waves? The last property that we are talking about, light polarization comes about this. So, all the discussion on polarization is something that, that is uh, well explained when you consider light as electromagnetic waves. And uh, it is not until um, Max Planck around uh, 1885, he uh, hypothesized that uh, light uh, emission as well as uh, absorption is uh, quantized, okay. So, you can say in certain ways that the modern optics evolved from, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, hypothesis by uh, Max Planck, uh, which essentially gives a much bigger picture and that is this topic of uh, quantum optics, right? Or uh, some people like to call it as photonics, where you start looking at uh, light emission and absorption as, as quantized and then of course, the final uh, piece in the puzzle uh, I think it is around 1915 that Einstein declared that um, light itself comprises of uh, um, quanta of energy, which uh, was later coined as photons, right. So, 
all this thing about the, uh, the quantum nature, the particle nature of light, you know, uh, there is lot more uh, uh, discussion and lot more research that was happening uh, beyond, beyond that particular point, ok. So, this is sort of a brief history of how this uh, field has developed and uh, we are going to try to uh, spend some time trying to understand what if you treat light as ray, what can you, what are the kind of problems that you can solve by just treating light in terms of rays of light, ok, propagation of light in, in terms of rays of light. And you would be surprised to find that pretty much, you know, more than half or I would say it is a very large proportion of uh, optical systems can be modeled with just simple concept of ray optics, ok. And we are going to try to uh, take some examples uh, of that. Um, so, one ex and, and then we will go on in the subsequent lectures, we will uh, say ok, what are we missing in ray optics and what can we capture in wave optics and then we go on to what are we missing in wave optics that we capture in electromagnetic optics and so on, right. So, that is that is how we are going to progress uh, going forward, ok. So, let us just take an example of uh, uh, endoscopy. Right? So, that is something that we were uh, throwing out a little earlier. What is endoscopy? It is about putting an optical probe through your body to see inside parts of your uh, uh, body, uh, things that we cannot see from uh, just outside. Um, and that essentially uh, is clearly facilitated by an optical probe. So, let us go ahead and design an endoscope, ok, shall we? So, what do we need to, you know, de design this optical probe? What are the principles that we need to understand? And so, it happens that there are two uh, basic principles. Um, one is uh, called law of uh, reflection and another is called law of uh, refraction, ok. So, what are we dealing with in terms of uh, law of reflection? Um, you basically say ok, you have a reflecting surface over here and then if you have a, a wave that is incident on this uh, or, a, or a light ray that is incident on this uh, surface at an angle let us say theta i it is going to get reflected at an angle theta r, right. Now, it can be proved that, you know, you can say this is, this, if this is the path of least time, if you start from Fermat's principles, uh, it is just a couple of steps that you can uh, uh, use. Uh, uh, one of the key um, uh, clues in that is that what if the light had gone straight down, right. Uh, you you look at that and then you fold it back and then you can prove that theta r equals to theta i. That is the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence, ok. This is once again something that you would have studied in high school physics, you are all very familiar with it, right. Now, the other thing that you may be very familiar with is this law of refraction where we say, ok, you have an um, interface between two uh, material, ok, and in optics, what do we use to characterize different material? Huh? Refractive index, right. So, let us say this is N1 and this is N2 and this is the normal over here and then if I have a light ray coming in with an angle theta 1. Um, in this case, part of the light may be reflected, um, but the other part of the light is going into this uh, second medium with angle theta 2 
and then we have this famous law known as uh, Snell's law which says n1 sin theta 1 equal to n2 sin theta 2, right. So, this is also something that you are very familiar with and of course, um, it is not too difficult to prove this, um, you know, uh, 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 just from geometric perspective, but it is more easily probably proven uh, from the electromagnetic perspective considering the boundary condition between the uh, two media and all that, right. So, but, but let us just take this for granted and, and move on. Now, if you say you have this Snell's law and if you consider a specific condition where n1 is greater than n2, okay, this is al already going to imply that if you were to plug it in Snell's law, it says that theta 2 is greater than theta 1, right. If n1 is greater than n2, then uh, if you plug that into Snell's law, it's, it, it comes up with this uh, uh, simple uh, implication that theta 2 has to be greater than theta 1. And it is only, you know, as a matter of some other value of theta 1 equal to theta c, where theta 2 becomes pi by 2, right. So, as you keep increasing theta 1, it gets to a certain angle where, uh, uh, you know, which you can label as theta c at which theta 2 equal to pi by 2. Now, if you write the Snell's law at that particular point, it basically says n1 sin theta c equal to n2 sin of pi by 2, which is equal to 1. So, this you say is n2 and uh, in other words, if you say, uh, if you define this angle theta c, this is sin inverse of n2 over n1, right. So, that is uh, a fairly simple uh, proof of what that critical angle is. And uh, what happens beyond that critical angle? If theta 1 is greater than theta c, total internal reflection. right and total internal reflection says that um, in, 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 the, in the same case that we were uh, drawing over here, uh, if you have your interface here, if n1 is greater than n2 and theta1 greater than theta c, then all the light that is incident on this interface is going to get uh, reflected, right. So, you have total internal reflection and if you project this forward and say what if we have one more interface over here which is uh, bounded by N2, okay, then if this is theta 1 and these two interfaces are parallel then this angle of incidence is also going to be the same angle theta 1. So, you would have reflection happening over here as well. So, essentially if you manage to get this angle right when you are launching light into this, into this uh, structure, then it can be confined within that structure and it can propagate over certain distance as long as these two interfaces are parallel to each other, right. So, that is essentially the underlying principle in endoscopy. You are launching light into this structure and through this process of total internal reflection, it is going to carry all that information to the other end, okay. Now, of course, there is a uh, uh, you know, limit to uh, what angles it can gather and to examine that limit, you need to understand what is happening at this interface at the launch side, okay. And, but we do not have time to discuss that right now. So, let us stop here and let us continue in the next session how uh, we can define what is the cone of 
light rays that we can capture within this waveguide as far as an endoscope is concerned. And I would also want you to think about this. This is leading on to the next topic that we are going to discuss. Okay. You can do this experiment with me. Right. Take your thumb and index finger, any other finger that you like. Okay. And uh, look through this. And then you look through this with them far apart, you can clearly see what is going on on the other side. Right. And then you take it closer, closer, closer and to the point where you are touching the other finger, then obviously you are not seeing anything through that. But just retract a little bit, just before you touch that other finger, you will actually see that you are not, a, well, you won't be able to see through, just before you touch that other finger. Okay. Now you can try that now or at home or in your room, wherever, but I want you to come back the next session when um, Thursday and I want you to tell me what is happening, why you are not able to see the light even though there is a gap between the two fingers. Okay? And that will be the motivation for what we are going to do next. Okay? Thank you.